Welcome to Keep Smiling, the e-commerce customer experience podcast. Selling products online is challenging and can lead to poor experiences. We explore how entrepreneurs and organizations create better experiences for the people they serve. Amazon, Shopify, artificial intelligence. We'll discuss what matters today and what you can do to build a better e-commerce business. Hello, listeners, and thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ty Walters, and with me again today is my co-host, Michael Melgar. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's staying safe and is doing great. We've missed you. Thanks so much for joining us today. And today is episode 26 of the Keep Smiling podcast, and we're recording this on June 17th, 2020. Our previous episode, if you're following along, was recorded at the end of March. So it's been some time since we've published an episode here. And the topic of today is part of that reason. It's entitled The Top Five Lessons Learned from COVID-19. And this is going to apply for customer service teams, e-commerce merchants, or even other businesses that struggled during this time uh, that was a, you know, a situation that was felt collectively across the world. Let's start at the beginning. So in our previous two episodes, we covered COVID-19 and some of the early things that we saw happening in e-commerce and in customer service related to Amazon, things that our clients as e-commerce merchants were experiencing. We offered some tips. So uh, p- please feel free to go back and check those out. But now, Several months later, the entire world is still experiencing COVID-19 to various degrees. I know some states are more open than others. Policies are changing and loosening for the most part, but we're still in it. Uh, there's still people wearing masks in, in both of our local communities. But during this time, uh, Michael and I, we got fully invested and focused in our business. And it, through uh, March through early June, and, and even still today, we got very busy. And what we wanted to do today is bring some of those lessons and some of that experience from those several weeks and months to you today and and some of the lessons that we learned. And in those lessons we learned from COVID-19, in each one of those lessons, there's a mistake. And it's a mistake that either we as as a customer service agency made, or it's a mistake that we saw some of our clients making. So Excited to share this with you today and um, hope you're staying safe, like Michael said. Absolutely. And, it, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic caught everyone by surprise. So just like you and, and every business owner that we know was in a position where we had to work quickly to make the best decisions uh, necessary to, to turn around and, and decide, okay, what, how do I keep my business afloat? What do I need to do to, to meet increased demand or, or perhaps the opposite? Maybe you were working with uh, less demand. What do I need to do to reinvent myself, reinvent my business to continue on and, and continue growing? You know, and so with all of this happening all at once, what we noticed is that there was just a challenge in just being able to take a step back and digesting all this information. And that's what we're hoping to do today is kind of like our top five lessons learned. The idea being is we don't want to repeat the same mistakes twice. We have now gone through this this period of the pandemic that affected all of these businesses. How do we make sure that that sort of thing does not happen again? How do we make sure that if another pandemic, God forbid, were to occur, how do we prepare to make sure that this sort of thing does not cause uh, challenges in the future? Right. And so the theme is sort of looking back at what we learned so far and not to say that it's over or it's not continuing to develop and and other changes aren't on the horizon, but uh, we're starting to feel some of the accelerated demand from that slow down a little bit. So not only do we feel like it was the right time to start to share some of this information, but in our own business, we reached a point where we felt like we could finally step away and dedicate some uh, some time to share this content. So let's jump into it, Michael. The first lesson that we learned from COVID-19 was have a backup solution for growing your team. And another way to think of this is having a backlog of hireable people. Yeah. And so the reason why we state that is because whether you're in a position like ours where, you know, we're an agency and, and we essentially have our own hiring process in, instead of making our, our clients uh, find their own customer service team, we're taking on that part of the process. And so on our end, it was making sure that we had enough staff to make sure that we can account for increased demand. On your end, it might mean 
okay, like, does this mean that you need to have more people in your warehouse? Does this mean that you need more customer service staff? How it might have impacted your individual business could have varied, but keeping in mind the possible backup solution for increased demand, really, in this case, and making sure that you have the ability to do so quickly. So I guess to wrap up those, those thoughts in my head, it's having an existing system in place and having it updated to the point where you can quickly turn around and, and, and hire as quickly as you need to without sacrificing the potential things that you do need to look out for, right? Like hiring, we know firsthand, we tend to be very, very careful with hiring because we know that this isn't the type of position that would work for everyone. And because of that, there might be a natural delay in that process under regular circumstances. Yeah, we evaluated over 1,000 applications in just a few weeks of having those postings live. A couple of them, I don't want to say they went viral, but they leaked out into sites that we were totally unaware of, which brought in even greater numbers of applicants. So in one respect, it's a good problem to have, but it just further delayed our ability to make it through all those applications to evaluate them and go through our normal hiring process. I think we wish we, we could have accelerated that maybe two or four times faster to the point where we were kind of hurting for a while. We were understaffed. We wish we could have gotten that person in our staff helping us much faster. And I'd like to contrast this too with you, you could have the problem of in, in, in business fluctuations and market fluctuations, you're either growing or you're shrinking. And if you're shrinking, maybe in most cases, it's easier to let people go on short notice than it is to hire them and add them to your team on short notice. So we're emphasizing the latter here that when you do experience this increased demand or increased activity, how fast can you have your posting out, evaluate those applicants, filter them through your system, make an offer and get them actually up and running because you could make the right choice. You could make the offer to that team member or that future team member, but then there's still the time. How long is it going to take to train them to get them removing some of the load from your existing team? And uh, we ended up hiring an individual during this time and we're in the training phase now and, and we're already seeing some of the return on that. But I think instead of it being June getting that return, I, I think we wish it would have been happening in May or, or even earlier in April. So uh, I got great business advice from a mentor one time and he talked about, you know, as a service business, you need to build your bench, which meant have a collection, a group of people, an audience that is nearby. They're not part of your team right now, but when you need them, they're close at hand. So adding them to your team, adding them to an active role in your team is a faster process um, and you can accommodate that growth with much less pain on your existing team. Absolutely. And, and one thing to keep in mind as well is that in our case, we knew that we had to be very strategic about who we needed to hire and how that would impact our day to day. Because when you do hire someone, depending on perhaps the, the complexity of the role, there is this natural startup time that, that Ty touched on in which perhaps someone on your team is then taking, is essentially taking more time from their schedule. So now you're almost down two people in order to get the, the new person trained and, and going. And so, but this is a natural part of the training process. So this is kind of where, where we're talking about building your bench might not necessarily just mean having an audience ready to potentially hire, but also having that process in place where you know that, okay, these are the exact skill sets that I need. So, it, you know, that might be as simple as a job listing, knowing the specifics of part-time, full-time, knowing the specifics of what role they need to accomplish. And then understanding what makes someone good in that role, understanding what those, how those skill sets would translate to your, you know, to even things such as the, the training process. Like, do you need to start them completely from scratch or do you hire, do you maybe spend more money to hire someone with a bit more experience? Those are the decisions you would need to make and that you should think of to avoid being caught by surprise in a situation like COVID-19 or even just like, any situation really where there's an increased demand for your services. And uh, one thing that we learned as an agency is that through the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing the degree to which that's affecting the personal lives of our team members. When they aren't working with Seller Smile and they're at home and they're going through their daily lives, they may be more or less restrained or constrained in their homes with the quarantine. They might be in assistive roles with their family members. So 
taking that into account as a business owner, sometimes that is an added reason why you need to have this backup solution for growing your team. Maybe the amount of, of volume you're dealing with as a, as a business is, doesn't change as much. But if your team is experiencing added stresses from different areas in their lives, that might be reason enough to add more assistance onto your team. And of course you can approach this from several ways. You can offer them assistance, maybe, um, I've heard of businesses offering additional stipends or bonuses during this time to help offset some of the, the unusual costs. Maybe you give additional days off or hours off to these team members. I know one thing that we've done in Seller Smiles, we've been more flexible with our team member schedules and they can take the time off that they need to, to navigate their personal lives. And for a while at the beginning of COVID-19, for you, especially Michael, it was, um, especially those living in, in um, metropolitan areas, there were grocery stores that were sold out of essential items for weeks at a time. So you and other team members needed that extra time just to get the normal items that they would be able to find. Sometimes you needed to visit four or five, six different stores to find those items. So keeping that in mind, anything like COVID-19 happening in the future is going to put an extra stress on your existing team. So if you are in a position to add to that team to offset that cost, be ready to do it fast. And I would even argue that even, even independent from COVID-19, just understand that your team members have personal lives that may be affected in different ways at different times in their life, right? And whether, you know, whether that is beneficial to your business or not, at the end of the day, people have lives and, and it, you know, it, in the example that Ty mentioned, that might mean needing to step away during the regular workday to go get groceries because perhaps there might be limited hours where they, they might actually be able to do so. And so it sounds kind of uh, uh, strange in this situation, but the reality is that one component of being able to just live and, and, and work a job regularly is having groceries, is being able to take care of yourself, right? And so, you know, that's something that as a business owner, being able to prioritize that, being able to account for it will ensure that you're able to, to help your team live a healthy life, being able to be healthy contributors to your company while also allowing them to, to have a, a healthy personal life outside of it. So I guess it, it, to summarize the, the, these, this idea is you want to have a solution ready or in place so that if you're ever in a position where you have to make quick decisions, perhaps you're able to rely on, on freelancers. Perhaps you have an email list of, of, of people that you've interviewed before that you really liked. Perhaps you are familiar with services like Seller Smile. You have them as a backup and you know that if you ever needed to take a step and, and need to hire quickly, you have a solution in place that accounts for each of those parts of the hiring process, the interviewing process, the actual hiring itself, the administrative work that comes with that, the training process, all of these things are things that can be very time consuming and under increased pressure, increased demand can be vitally important. And we've discussed this between ourselves. Is we used to see hiring as a process where it's on or it's off when we need it, it's on. When we don't, it's off. And I think we are more convinced now in, in what we've seen happen to have more of an evergreen approach. Maybe we're always hiring even when we don't necessarily need it at that time because we don't know when we will need it. And maybe aligning, and we're going to get to this like setting expectations a little bit, but for the candidates that do apply, setting those expectations that maybe they're not going to hear back from us uh, in a couple of weeks or even in a couple of days. They might be waiting for several months we're in a position where we interviewed someone after over a year. Um, so I think having a longer drawn out, constant, consistent process in the background is going to make it easier for us to add people to our team when we need to in the future. So let's move on to the second lesson learned from COVID-19. And that is exercise full transparency. The opposite side of this coin is providing the wrong expectations, which can result in a misunderstanding or confusion and frustration on behalf of your customer or your clients. When the person on the other side of the transaction is frustrated, is confused, it's ultimately a very poor experience. And uh, we try to advise our clients and, and as well in our own business and, and how to reduce those. Absolutely. So providing an excellent customer experience is often confused with tell your customer yes every single time. And I think that it, it isn't always comfortable to turn around and say, hey, unfortunately, we're, we can't accomplish that. We're unable to get, you know, in, in the case of a lot of what we saw with our clients in e-commerce. We saw a lot of delays with shipment, for example, and some clients felt like they could be much more forthcoming with that and, and explain that and, and explain what was happening. Other clients perhaps 
wanted to, I, I don't even know if I'd say necessarily hide that that was happening, but essentially they were, they were trying to dismiss it. They were trying to not lead on to there was any, any potential issues there. And I think there's a lot of different ways that that can, can backfire. But in terms of providing an excellent customer experience, we see a big component of that being managing expectations. That might be as simple as being able to communicate the delays and being sincere about what is happening. You're being proactive. Perhaps you know, you're, you're essentially, you could, you could have an, on, on our site, for example, we even had a chat message that would pop up on our onboarding screen to say, hey, unfortunately, uh, we're dealing with increased demand due to COVID-19. We want to get you started as soon as possible, but here's what's happening. Uh, schedule, time, schedule a time with us here and we'll be happy to help you. So even though that might turn away some potential business, we're being transparent, communicating potential delays. So that way your customer knows in this case, what to expect, what is happening. They're hearing it directly from you versus seeing these potential delays, not having an explanation for why it's happening. And instead that causes frustration. So, you know, in in our case, we saw that being specific when you can is, is something that is extremely helpful, providing an explanation for what is happening? You know, hey, we're dealing with increased demand due to COVID nineteen. This is impacting our shipping fulfillment times. For example, we use Amazon as our fulfillment network. They are prioritizing products that they are accepting at this time. Like, it's okay to explain that. It's okay to let your customer know that this is happening because, again, you're providing an explanation. You're you're allowing them to become a part of the like of the potential solution. You're giving them outcome like some potential solutions for how to fix their issue. But at the end of the day, you're providing an explanation up front versus being caught in a position where your customer is unhappy because you didn't provide the proper expectations up front. If you're selling on Amazon, there's fewer touch points where you can provide transparency. Most of Amazon is is pretty cookie cutter. There's templates of product detail pages and your seller profile page and things of this nature. You don't have as many areas to even express these types of aspects of your business. But if we're talking about social media properties or your website, there are plenty of areas. There's your homepage, every page on your website, there's chat widgets, there's your email marketing. And I think one of the things that we saw is, well, we're recommending full transparency here. It's sort of overwhelming as a business owner. If you think about all those different areas and touch points, soon you're talking about like a multi-day overhaul of a lot of your copy that's going to be temporary and you're thinking you're going to switch it back at some point. But no matter how much pain that takes to adjust, we see the benefit happening with the customer experience where it's cutting down on customers coming to you asking questions because they saw it in your email that was sent proactively or they saw it on your website in the checkout area on the page or or their cart even. So displaying these types of messages in as many places as possible, I think sets those expectations, like Michael was saying, reduces the confusion and helps them have a better experience. And while the business owner or the merchant might be worried that if I extend my shipping times or if I communicate delays, maybe I'll lose the customer. Well, a certain percentage this will happen with, of course, but I think we'd like to emphasize um, the other end of that where most customers really appreciate the sharing of information and they're probably going to choose you and, and and to purchase your product or to go with your business because they see that adaptation to a unique circumstance. So they know that if anything happens like that in the future, you're probably going to communicate in a similar way. They're watching out for you. They're thinking about you and they're not leaving it up to chance to, to hope that you get your product on time. I think the most common issue in, in customer emails we've seen is some variation of like, where's my package? And that situation is definitely exacerbated if that customer paid for expedited or premium shipping somehow. And in the worst days, in the slowest days of COVID-19, even those packages were delayed. So there's no right answer here, but I I think the more a, a business owner and a merchant can do to communicate when things are not as they normally are, the better. Absolutely. And managing your customer's expectations will produce more trust. You're not using your explanation as an excuse. You're being forthcoming and, and, and explaining why their order might be delayed in this case, in this example, right? Why their order might be delayed and possible solutions for that. But you're not using it as an excuse. You're not like just brushing it off by saying, oh, sorry, this was shipping delayed due to COVID-19. By being forthcoming, by being specific, providing that explanation, you're increasing your customer's trust. You're building better business, better client relationships. At the end, what we've seen in our personal experience is that by building trust, you're earning returning business. 
those customers are going to come back because they know that they can trust you. You know, one, one example I think of is we work with a company that uses a, a company named Printful and Printful was communicating these long fulfillment times, in some cases, up to 25 days in order to even get their order shipped. And right away, right, that sounds like a turnoff because we're used to like, oh, I get my items in two days or less. But Printful communicating that up front, they had a page up with expected shipping times on all their items. They even had something stating like, hey, our our customer service team will, will not be alive on chat during these hours to allow us to catch up on email support. And it's that that sort of transparency makes me trust them more as a company because I, I know they're not just trying to please customers to a fault by being truthful and explaining what's happening. The customers will understand. And the ones who don't understand, you might lose out on their business, but it, it might be okay. Maybe that's not your target audience. Right. I even think this, taking this down to a personal level, I immediately trust someone that is vulnerable is sharing information that might be um, unflattering in certain ways because you know that they don't have this sort of like artificial veil. Uh, They're not trying to exude perfection because we all understand that we all have these errors, these shortcomings. Let's go to the third lesson here. And this is invest in diversity. This lesson arose from a mistake that we saw in our clients and, and even maybe in our own business in certain cases that there is an over-reliance on single systems. We see this when there's only one way to do something and maybe it might be working. So there's no investment, no consideration made for what else could we do or how could we make it better or how could we make it different. In general, looking at any system, any process in your business, if there's a greater number of ways, there's different ways to do something generally that's going to be better for longevity because when one of those ways disappears or when one of those ways or methods or platforms is affected, there's something else to shift to and there's familiarity with an alternative. So let's talk about some of the ways that we saw that expressed a little bit more specifically with our e-commerce clients. Yeah. So I think of the quote, this is working right now. So why change it? COVID-19 flipped that mindset upside down and for, for many of us, right? And so the way that we see this is essentially just having contingency plans and a plan to you know fill in the gaps to reduce those sort of redundancies. A perfect example of this that we saw during COVID-19 was the dependence on Amazon's fulfillment because we saw a lot of people who had to move to a fulfillment by a merchant model where they have to self-fulfill now and they've relied on Amazon to do things like take care of their customer service, taking in their inventory and, and shipping it. Those are things that when that switch is, is flipped off, you then are left with all these challenges that you have to solve for quickly and do so to meet these increased and changing demands, right? So if you can identify areas in your business where you are over relying on something, it might even be as simple as like perhaps you use one software system that you just have always used because it's just been there since the beginning of your business. Was it strained during the COVID-19 pandemic? Is there things that you should consider to change it? Because if you find yourself in a position like this again, you're going to have to make that decision quickly. And knowing what your options are, having a potential backup plan is going to help you in these cases. And one of the ways to express diversity in your business is consider the degree to which you're dependent on geographical locations. And this could mean buildings. This could mean cities, for instance. Um, if uh, we saw like stay-at-home orders and, and quarantine taking place. So if your business primarily relies on people coming into the office to communicate, to work on their projects. Of course, that's going to see a massive amount of disruption during times like this. So increase and invest your diversity as a company by creating and cultivating those systems that allow people to work from home, that allow people to work from anywhere. Those are going to be digital systems for communication and, and for work and for file sharing, things of that nature. And maybe you didn't need it before for the past 10 or 20 years, but it's rare events like this that make those systems vital. And I know we saw many, many businesses across a variety of industries adapting when they had to. Maybe they didn't work from home at all before, and then they went to a, a work from home system completely. Some of those businesses might return to business as usual after all the policies around COVID-19 have resolved. But we talked about this before the call. What about COVID-20 or COVID-21? Not to say those are real, but another event similar to this that forces people to self-quarantine. How is your business going to survive and 
stay running. We saw several of our clients, they came to Seller Smile expressing interest in using our services because their current customer service team is fully in-house. They're in the warehouse, they're, they're in the office with the team or managing that customer service. So when they couldn't do that, maybe they weren't completely set up to be as efficient in a work from home situation. And, and they said to themselves, like, we don't want this to happen again. We want this outsourced. We want it to be a team that is not going to depend on our city or our county's regulations to be able to continue collaboration and work. So think about how you can diversify your location independence. And I would say the, the greater your independence from any location, any building, the better. Absolutely. And in the future, we might do an episode on how to uh, run a successful remote customer service team. I think there's, it comes with its own challenges, but a lot of benefits. And especially during COVID-19, we saw that as one of our main benefits is that we were location independent. We did not deal with any issues of like, oh no, our, our customer service office, our office where we do our work is, is completely shut down. You know, we now have to pivot and, and, and learn how to use conference call tools or learn how to use communication tools. These are all things that can be easily solvable by even, even if you do end up going back to an office, perhaps just invest time in maybe two or three days or you know, out of the week are remote days so that your team has some sort of guideline for what that looks like if it ever needs to happen. Another example of what we saw happening a lot was like, again, the, the transition to merchant fulfillment. That was a very, very difficult process for many. So what does that mean now as things begin to slow down or, or hopefully slow down is perhaps you need to hire an expert to help you figure out some of these merchant fulfillment systems before the next COVID-19 type of issue were to happen. Not necessarily a pandemic, right? It doesn't have to be a pandemic. It might just be something that's unique to your business. Maybe your business goes viral and all of a sudden you are dealing with increased demand that where this is what you wanted for your business. You wanted all this growth, but if you're not ready to rise to the occasion, you didn't, ha- you didn't plan for it. Right now is the time to plan for it before it happens. We talk about redundancy, how you know having two is one or one is none. There are certain circumstances where you're going to lose access to a system, access to a location. So what's the backup plan? And I think it goes beyond just having a plan. You can have a, an SOP in some document and you can refer to it and enact that plan whenever it happens. But I think even better would be to practice that plan. So not only are your, your team members uh, familiar with where the plan is or what the plan is, but they know what it feels like. Not only backup plans for, for geolocation, but also backups to your sales channels. If you're an e-commerce seller, this would be expressed in terms of not just selling on Amazon, but maybe you also have a website. You also have social media properties. Uh, maybe you have multiple different warehouses where you, you're doing fulfilled by merchant. We even see some of our clients, they have product inventory stored in their private homes. And they actually use them in these cases where maybe the stay-at-home orders were preventing them from going into their warehouses to access that inventory that was even outside of Amazon. So you could look at that as like they had to go to their maybe their second, their third, or their fourth contingency plan to keep things moving in their business. And this sort of thing can happen. It's a real world thing. Like one of our clients, for example, was using Amazon's fulfillment for most of their orders and then they moved to an external warehouse where they were doing some merchant fulfillment. We recently received an email where they were telling us, hey, unfortunately, we just found out that you know, our third-party fulfillment warehouse caught on fire last night. These are things that like life happens. You will have to have a backup plan and investing in some of these external processes, potential strategies. Those will be the things that will save you when the next issue, when the next big challenge arises. When we we spoke about diversity here, diversifying your business, the word innovation came to mind and innovation for the fact that when you think of it, it's, it's typically something that's new and something that's other than what you might currently be doing. But it also has this aspect that it's considering the future. And, and what's the next iteration of a certain process or technology to be tapped into your industry, understand what changes are coming so that you can plan for those changes and you can adapt because there's much more friction, many more issues that occur when those changes are made last minute, last second. I think the absolute worst mistake in this case is to resist change. If you're a company, for instance, that maybe 10 years ago, you didn't want to go online and and on Amazon or, on, or sell products through your website because your brick and mortar was working fine. And maybe now you're seeing some of the results of that where customers weren't out shopping in public as they normally were. So 
if you were to imagine that situation and adopting innovation when it first happened, when Amazon is new, when e-commerce is new, if you were to make those changes, they're always going to be uncomfortable. But if you adopt those changes, you learn about them, you're much more prepared than when that technology becomes the very thing that you need to survive. And I think Ty and I have been very attached to this idea because we, we've been in the startup world for so long. So this concept of, of, of getting scrappy is something that's like natural to us. But you know, getting scrappy doesn't necessarily mean you have to get messy or, or that you're just kind of like going out and, and not without direction or being aimless. That's not what it means. It means understanding what's happening and then being very methodical about what are some potential solutions that I can do right now? What are some things that I can work towards? Right. So a perfect example of that, you know, Ty and I both thought of right away, it's not necessarily e-commerce, but it's a perfect example of it is, you know, restaurants that, that switched to doing curbside service. One of the local restaurants here and near where I live started to sell margaritas to go that came in like little Capri Sun looking packages. And that sounds wild, right? Like I would have never thought of that, but guess what? Now there's people who are able to come and support their business because they were able to respond to change quickly even though their restaurant and bar might have been closed, they had a solution in place for it. It might not be exactly what people would want, but it's still something that is going to keep people coming back. Definitely. They diversified their product offering in that case to something that was completely appropriate for the time. And I'm guessing that it contributed to their ability to stay in business. We had a client who started to send free masks with their purchase, right? And, and it wasn't something that was, I would say, even directly related to, to masks or anything related to COVID-19, but just, you know, something like that is, is like a, a one simple mechanism that they added to their, a part of their process that allowed them to, in, in fact, receive an increased amount of sales because of it. And as a business, this falls under the umbrella of investing in diversity is that what we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic is that online retail is very resilient. Right at the beginning in late March when everything was happening, Michael and I were unsure of the future of our business and and the future of e-commerce because you can't really predict how things are going to go. And we imagined a scenario where if people aren't able to go to work, they're making less money. So maybe they aren't spending, they're not shopping as much. I think generally we saw the opposite occur where although people were losing jobs and unemployment was at record rates, we saw online retail spiking and and at least customer inquiries about their online retail spiking. So what we're seeing now, not to get into specifics, but Amazon is now loosening many of the restrictions and and policies they put into place for COVID-19, not necessarily in their fulfillment centers with social distancing, but in the types of policies that would affect a seller to restock. Uh, We're seeing delivery times now getting much faster around the nation. They used to be two, three, four weeks for even like FBA prime eligible items and those returning to normal. And to deal with something as disruptive and as massive as COVID-19 was in the midst of the pandemic, we're almost back to normal with e-commerce and Amazon. That's just amazing to me. So if you were to diversify into Amazon and and other online channels, I think you'd benefit a great deal with that resiliency. There's so many uh, advantageous factors. You don't have to reopen a physical store. You don't have to have social distancing on your website. So just think of the ways that it could benefit your business if you're not quite online integrated right now, because I think it's going to make your business much more resilient in the future. But I believe, I would guess that this COVID-19 pandemic is going to accelerate the share that e-commerce has in retail. There's a bright, big future ahead. Absolutely. And now if your business is in a position where things are starting to to come back to normal or, or like slowing down, right, to maybe to more of a normal pace, right now is the time to think about these things and have those solutions in place and, and think about the diversification because, again, these are going to be the tools that are going to help you in the future. Let's move on to the fourth lesson that we took from COVID-19, and that's understand your metrics. The mistake being not fully understanding your metrics. Some of the clients we work with, they are running their business more or less by feel. But some of our clients, on the other hand, are running their business very closely related to the types of metrics that they're seeing. Let's speak a little bit about what does it mean to understand your metrics and why is that a lesson that we took away from this pandemic? Certainly. So I think that with the increased pressure during COVID-19, that just adds stress to everyone and especially business owners, right? Like as Ty and I mentioned, we were thinking about, oh, you know, how is this going to impact our business? What do we need to do to, to prepare for it? What do we need to do now to like make sure that we were able to transition in a very 
a methodical way. Those are the types of things that if we don't understand the day-to-day metrics that affect the things that we do, we won't be able to make those data-informed decisions that we need to make that, that are going to help us in fixing those issues, especially when we're under increased pressure, increased demand. One a simple example of this is we had a couple of times during the COVID-19 pandemic where some of our clients might have like felt panicked by seeing the, the amount of refunds that might have been happening. And so they, you know, they might have come to us and say, hey, what's, what's happening? What's going on? And after like investigating together, we might have found, oh, it looks like some customers are approaching Amazon directly about these shipping delays and Amazon is refunding the customer for you, right? So that's one example of perhaps you have your customer service team tracking refunds. Perhaps you know exactly where you're able to go get the report on your seller central refunds, just as an example, right? Where you know exactly where the source is coming, you know how often it happens during regular circumstances. And then if there's a spike in that activity or if there's a downtrend in that activity, you're able to then pick up on that and and point to exactly what's happening. Right. So especially during COVID-19, as we mentioned, there was a lot of moments where it it could be easy to look at something in panic versus understanding what's happening and then allowing that data to help you make a better decision. Figure out which data that you need to be viewing to make these important decisions. This might be something that you can do on your own as a business owner. Maybe you need to hire an expert. Maybe you need to research and and see how other people in your industry are doing it. But as long as you can tap into the, the data, that data is clear and it helps you to make informed decisions, that's going to be a better course of action than making reactive decisions or decisions just based on feel. We can be a little bit more reactive and impulsive in in stressful times. And those types of decisions or or decisions made in those environments aren't always the best for your business. And being keyed into the right data and potential sources and and knowing how to understand it, that's going to prevent you from making a decision based out of fear. A positive example of this that we had with one of our clients is that we did see an increased number of refunds occurring. And so when we investigated that situation further, we realized, oh, This is happening because people were unhappy about the shipping delays that were happening. So they were canceling their orders or they were, you know, initiating a return because they were like, okay, I'm going to buy this somewhere else because I'm not getting it in time. And once we were able to start from the top there by identifying the issue, the alarm was the number of refunds that were occurring. And then understanding that was, okay, this is happening because of cancellations and returns. And then ending that with a solution that's informed by both of those items. And in this case, you know, our client decided to upgrade the shipping speeds for all of our orders and eating that cost versus passing off that cost to their, to our customers. So our customers might've ordered standard shipping, but on their end, turn around and upgrade the fulfillment shipping times in order to keep these customers happy and prevent from further cancellations or returns or or even prevent from these items further hurting their, their metrics in this case. Yeah. And we, and we did see Amazon announced that they were waiving taking certain actions against seller accounts based off of if the metrics uh, exceeded certain thresholds of maybe defect rates or return rates, refund rates. Uh, but now Amazon is saying, okay, that, that grace period is over. We're actually coming back to evaluating you as we were before. But I think I was really proud to see that action on behalf of this, this client as well, that they took a customer-centric approach they were able to uh, justify losing a little bit of money to keep customers happy. And, and ultimately, taking a short-term hit is going to keep them in business and keep customers coming back. And one caveat to this is that, you know, after you've made your decisions based on some of these metrics, and after you, know, you, you understand them now, you perhaps implement a strategy for how to deal with it. One important aspect of this is giving yourself enough time to test that strategy. So that might mean you need to stick to that process or that strategy for long enough to know if it worked. So that means you can't switch out too fast. You might need to let it play out a little bit, you know, launch that update, collect some data, and then come back and make a decision, make an informed decision to see if something needs to change or if you can keep doing what you're doing or go from there, right? And we actually, one of our earlier episodes, episode six, was about crowdsourcing actionable improvements from your customer service. This goes into this a bit more, into this idea a bit more deeply. But, you know, again, once you've made your decision, give your solution enough time to play out and then again, collect data, understand what's happening, contextualize it, and then make an informed decision going forward from there. Right. Let's move on to the the fifth lesson and the final lesson we learned from COVID-19. And that's to remember your why. And this is 
knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it. The mistake is losing sight of your goals, losing sight of that purpose of, of why you have your business and, and why you have your service or, or why you're doing what you're doing. Remembering your why, I think, helps to contextualize and to justify all of the short-term panic and disappointment that might be occurring during times like this, and it helps you get through it. If you lose focus of your core reason for your business, it's easier to give up. It's easier to make poor decisions. It's easier to shy away from making the tough effort that it takes to get through something like this. So there was definitely times at Seller Smile uh, in, in um, March, April, May, and even in the early June where it was really tough. We had our team, very thankful for them. They, they dedicated an above average effort for weeks at a time to help us get through it and to work through the added demand that we had. And it was difficult for us as business owners and, and we should have the strongest why and the, and the most resilience, but everyone suffers differently during stressful times and having a strong purpose and a reminder of that purpose is going to help you get through it. So let's talk about some more specific ways about how to keep that why in your vision and maybe how to shift to a more long-term focus instead of maybe on what might be happening at this moment or during this month. Certainly. As uncomfortable as some of this period has been in, in many of our lives, the reality is that change is really the only constant that's real. Change is always happening, perhaps not as drastic as something as like COVID-19, but it will happen. Remembering your why, we've talked about a vivid vision before, right? Maybe that means a legitimate document where you've thought about what you want out of your business. And especially during times of increased stress, increased pressure, you're coming to that because that is going to serve as your guide for the next steps. It's going to serve to give you energy and optimism because you're remembering your long-term goals and you're not allowing this like potential tunnel vision or, or short-term focus, you know, your short-term disappointment, you know, stray you away from those goals. Especially if you're like a business owner, a leader in your company, if you're a, a manager of your customer service team, or even if you're just a customer service agent, remembering that reason will help you get through some of these tough times and be able to get through it and come out the other end and still enjoy the long-term benefits of why you even started it, why you're even part of it. Yeah, I think just as humans, we all have a bias to overrate short-term circumstances over long-term ones. And so that means that maybe the pain or the pleasure that we're experiencing today or in the current moment is we give that a little bit more thought and consideration as much as we can do to move away from that, to see that long-term goal. I think it just makes it easier to get through those tough times and, and we're already coming out of it now. So, and it's funny how, you know, in the midst of it and during those long nights, it just, it was the worst. It really felt hard to get through, but now, even looking back several weeks or months later, it already feels a little bit less powerful or painful. Absolutely. And it might be as simple as just investing time in your mental and physical health. You know, we're not trying to come off with a, a hippy dippy message, but at the end of the day, we are not robots. We are human. You can't brute force 100% productivity all the time. And especially during times of increased stress, you or your team are going to be dealing with it in different ways. And so you have to keep your pulse on. How, you are, how you're feeling, how your team is feeling, and make sure that you prioritize that. Maybe it's like prioritizing time away. That sounds crazy, especially if you're dealing with increased demand, but maybe it means you need to prioritize for someone on your team to take some time away because that might help them come back and feel recharged and re-energized. On my end, for example, I was limiting my news intake. I was prioritizing more time doing the things that I really enjoy doing outside of work. Things like that. Being mindful, right? These are all things that while it might seem perhaps not directly related to your business, it absolutely is because your business is run every single day by humans and humans are affected by things like COVID-19. Taking time to, to account for those things. You know, we talked earlier about remote days for your company. Those are the types of things that you could do to perhaps like even give the staff that, that are on your team or give yourself the type of lifestyle that they want and allow them to do better work. So those are the things to take into account now. Again, remembering your why and being able to give that to your team as well. Right. I, I, I want to add to that to say, if you're like Michael mentioned, if you're a leader in your company of, of some sort, you might be a manager, you might be an owner. I think it's, it's one thing to advise your team members to take breaks and invest in their health. But I think it's more powerful to lead by example. If they see you 
expressing frustration, but then also at the same time, taking steps for yourself to, to meet that need, to take care of yourself. Your team members are going to feel maybe less guilt, less pressure to just brute force through it. So they're going to follow your lead. They're going to, they're going to mimic and, and mirror your energy. And they're also going to participate in the behaviors that, that you are and that you're, you've deemed acceptable within your organization. So if you're exercising, prioritizing mental health, I think it's uh, much more likely that the rest of your team will as well. And you will see a return on productivity. Don't do it just for that, but you will see a return on productivity. Ty sees this as myself all the time. I, I'm very open about it, but if I am overworking myself and I know that I'm overworking myself, I start making tiny mistakes or I feel less driven. I feel less motivated. My energy is drained. But sometimes even something as simple as just taking two solid days off, perhaps you're, you're completely logged off. If you run a team, you're allowing your team to do something like that. That is going uh, is gonna to have huge returns because your team members are going to come back rejuvenated. And that's, it's so important. You know, keep smiling. Positivity and love is always going to be stronger than stress and hate. And it's a top down thing. Exhibit that smiling attitude as a leader in your company. And you're going to make the, the rest of your team members feel comfortable and, and um, they're going to want to smile as well. I hope these top lessons were helpful. We're taking our own advice and, uh, you know, we're actively preparing for the next time that something like this happens. Absolutely. I hope everyone's had a very successful period during COVID-19. And I hope that as everything begins to slow down, you're able to take these lessons learned and perhaps even the lessons that you've learned in your own company and be very productive with that information and, and come back and, and improve and, and make your company better because of it. You're using this hypothetical setback in some ways in order to, to continue to push you towards the future of your business. And to summarize this episode, Michael found a very appropriate quote from a mysterious author. Yeah, it's unknown. Uh, but the quote is, be stubborn about your goals and flexible about your methods. If you have any questions or feedback about what we discussed today, or perhaps a request for a topic we should cover on a future episode, you can email us at keepsmiling at sellersmile.com. Stay safe and keep smiling.